Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Technology Tuesday webinar. We are happy to have such a great crowd today, and um, I just want to introduce myself. I'll be your host today. My name is Caitlin Lutz, and I am one of the dairy management specialists with the Cornell Cooperative Extensions Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team. Just as a reminder, any technical questions should go into the chat box and any questions for today's speaker can be entered into the question and answer or Q&A box. So without further ado, I'll introduce today's speaker, Tim Terry. Tim is a farm strategic planning specialist with Cornell's Pro Dairy. He has over 30 years of experience managing university and commercial dairies and um, providing nutrition services, as well as designing and inspecting agricultural structures. So today, Tim will be walking us through facility considerations when adding new technology to your farm. All right, Tim. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin. So we'll get right into it here. Now, when we're talking about uh, looking to retrofit or not retrofit, one thing we can say is that the constant in any business is change. And if you're not moving forward, you're falling behind. You know, expansions, new technologies, new enterprises should be a part of any sustainable farm's future. But when you do so, plan for new, remodeled, or retrofitted facilities carefully and thoughtfully. Otherwise, you may end up with a chaotic array of components that are inefficient and may, may make future improvements pretty much impossible. So why retrofit? Well, a lot of times it's for the sake of efficiency. You know, we're looking to add a new technology for the sake of production efficiency, and we're trying to use an existing structure for the sake of investment efficiency. However, if, not all, if all aspects are not carefully and dispassionately considered, this could lead you down a rosy path to a false economy. Unfortunately, we've seen these, the technology has just dropped in willy-nilly into the existing facility. Quite often, the farmer is simply satisfied with eliminating the, the rote labor, and they often miss the opportunities and benefits of technology. It's like buying a smoke smartphone for the sole purpose of making phone calls, never mind emails, texts, calendars, photos, and all those other things that that can do. And the chosen location is often determined by the least amount of work or disturbance to the herd. Yeah, it'll save you money now, but you pay for the inefficiencies and the ineffectiveness over the long haul. However, with a little forethought, that'll lead to good design and functionality rivaling even a new facility. Just understand it's going to require more changes, especially around that new technology. However, it does not address any deficiencies in animal comfort. So then the question becomes, do we build new or do we retrofit and remodel the existing structure? Well, first of all, let's consider the existing conditions. You know, if it's not meeting expectations of animal comfort, ventilation, or anything related to the internal environment, then that's a deal breaker. Remember, the sole purpose of these technologies is to perform rote tasks and collect data. It's up to you as the dairyman to provide the feed and housing conducive for production and growth. So then the question becomes, do we remodel and renovate or do we build new? Well, a helpful guideline in making that decision is if the remodel or retrofit is 50% or more of a new facility, consider going for the new facility. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule and there is some room for discretion in there. However, there are three reasons that support this. The first of these is we tend to overestimate the value of the existing structure. Now, there's almost always the sentimentality factor and it can be very hard to walk away from let alone raise the building that great grandpa constructed with his own two hands from the raw materials he found on site. 
However, we really need to see this as sunk capital. In other words, just as if it were sitting on the bottom of the ocean, it's gone, the investment is unrecoverable and throwing more good money after it is not a wise use of resources. Reason two is we tend to underestimate the cost of remodeling. Quite often, we can't appreciate the full scope of the project until we start peeling back the layers and exposing the hidden structure. You know, we may not even be able to install the new system without compromising the structural integrity of the facility. And many may feel they can reduce expenditures by doing, doing it themselves, but fail to consider the disparity in the skill levels between themselves and the professionals, the amount of tinkering required to retrofit a 21st century technology into a 19th century building, the availability of the necessary tools and materials, and lastly, how are they gonna fit this in with all the daily chores, the planting, the harvesting, and everything else that needs to get done? And the last one is fail to properly value the cost of the long-term inefficiencies that are going to remain with that old facility. You know, even if it takes only five minutes per day, that's only over a half hour per week and 30 hours per year. You know, however, it's rarely only five minutes and only one person. You know, and then add to this the potential reduction in the animal performance because of the inefficiency. So some other considerations. You know, space. Is there enough space to install the technology? You know, to allow it to work effectively, maintain it efficiently, and will there be rooms for upgrades and or future expansion? You know, it can be pretty short-sighted to shoehorn a system into a facility with no hope of any future improvements. Moreover, local codes may specify the space requirements and or the separation distances. So how about the layout? You know, can we install the correct number of units required to service the current number of animals? Now, manufacturers tend to promote a theoretical number of animal service per unit. And basically that's a mathematical formula of 24 hours divided by the duration of the visits. Now, there are some uh, units that they have worked on uh, a lot of the preparation part of it and have sped that up, but you're still dealing with a biological entity, you know, that has a certain, uh, it takes a certain amount of time for an endocrine system to respond. You know, and it's unlikely to achieve it too because animals aren't robots. They don't do math. They can't tell time, but they do have a diurnal rhythm. And they also tend to be, uh, a group oriented type of animal that will get up and go to these systems in groups rather than by themselves. So and then we have to factor in lost time due to daily maintenance. And if you're really on your game, you'll try to time that daily maintenance with the time that the animals aren't visiting the uh, either the robotic milker or the calf feeder, for example. You know, is the layout going to be logical and efficient? And many systems will use a common controller for multiple units, but again, they must be within certain distance of each other. You know, for robotic systems, you know, will the units be in a reasonable proximity to the collection point, i.e. the milk house? Um, when we look at these pumps, it's the hydraulics are there that, yeah, we could pump it five, 600 feet if we had to. The thing of it is five or 600 feet of stainless steel pipe, how are you going to get that clean? And can you sanitize it to the specifications of the health code regulations, which say that it has to, the water has to exit the pipe at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That's quite a trick if you can get it through that length of pipe and still keep the pressure, the temperature up. Now, livestock, especially large livestock, require certain minimum dimensions for passageways, turning radiuses and head-to-head -head intersections. And they also don't like apparent dead ends, mazes, dark areas, or shadows on the floor. And travel lanes should never require an animal to step up or down and change direction all in the same movement. You know, an example is right here with this foot bath. We have two head-to-head -head robotic milkers. The cows come out, they step down into this foot bath, and then almost at the same time, they have to step to the 
the right or the left in order to get out. Uh, so they're stepping down and turning at the same time. Now we'll talk a little bit more about foot bath placement in a little bit, but while we're here, I just thought, you know, this might be a better example of how to do that, that the animals are coming out almost in a straight line and the foot bath is at the same elevation as the rest of the floor. You know, and whenever possible, entries and exits should be straightforward and it should allow for them to pass fully through a one-way gate before changing direction. Now, whether the facility is naturally or mechanically ventilated, you'll most likely have to provide some supplemental ventilation in and around the particular units. Circulation fans can boost airflow over control room and tunnel and cross vented barns. And if you're like this farm, this is a cross vented barn and the, the cross vent is coming from the other side of this robot room, they installed an airfoil up here such that as the air comes across, the airfoil deflects it back down to cow level again. And then having a dedicated fan over a milking or feeding stall will keep the fresh air moving in the confined space as well as deterring biting flies in the summer. Pretty hard to get a cow to go into the robotic milker if she knows she's gonna get eaten alive. So here's the foot baths. You know, they should be placed for easy access and easy exclusion. Uh, and they should be placed where uh, the animals really have to go through them because voluntary foot baths just do not work. Now, in this particular situation, this is a two foot baths side by side in the far end of a group pen. Uh, the robots are in the opposite end. And what they do is Two to three times a week, they'll get the entire herd up and basically drive these animals through these foot baths, which to me seems kind of antithetical for um, what you're trying to get a robot system to do. And it's supposed to be quiet, let the cow do her thing on her time schedule. I would like them to have a narrow cross section because that's going to force a single line and it's also going to encourage them to keep moving. And the length forces multiple submersions of the feet. And we like to see these about 10 to 12 feet long. And this is based on a lot of the Wisconsin studies. But there's also some New Zealand studies that have said, yeah, we find that three to three and a half meters seems to be the ideal length. Well, if you do the math, three meters is a little bit less than 10 feet and three and a half meters is a little bit more than 12. So we're all talking the same story. Now the bottom of the foot pass should have good footing and should be at the same elevation uh, as that, as the um, ground around it. You don't want them stepping down or stepping up because that just seems to hold or halt uh, animal traffic through there. If you're going to pour a system, then the bottom of it should have a what we call a cork float or a broom finish on the bottom. Rubber mats also work well. Grooving while the concrete is wet works well as well, works well too. Uh, the thing it is, you don't want to have any ridges in there. There is a plastic foot bath out on the market, has a diamond pattern in it, but the, the diamond pattern is not grooves, it's ridges. So now you're putting all that cow's weight on a very narrow uh, area, which could lead to foot sores later on. You want at least one side to open out. That way, if an animal goes down, they should be able to get back on their feet. And it also makes it a lot easier for the operator to go in there and clean and recharge that system. Because if it isn't easy and quick to do, it won't get done. So that means we also need to figure in drain plugs and frostless hydrants in the design. And some farms you see in this photo here, elevate a coat of premixed solution or maybe just water and then the solution is mixed on the way to filling the foot bath. So that again, the whole system is very easy and can be recharged quickly. And something that's been out on the market for a little bit, we haven't seen too many of these, is a robotic or automatic foot bath. Basically what that does, it eliminates the rote labor again, and it's just push button effort. Uh, we'll get it done in a timely manner. Now, some use an overhead reservoir, others require a certain amount of flow rate supply coming in here because this system, there is a door that opens on this end that allows the foot, the foot bath material to run out 
And then we have these jets here on this end and this fluctuates up and down and hoses out the bottom of the uh, foot bath. And then once the door closes, it refills the foot bath and mixes the solution. On all of these, there is a programmable logic controller where the change frequency and chemical concentrations can be adjusted. And some like this one, like I said, have a clean water reservoir above and a, and a valve in the bottom. The, uh, the chemical concentrate jugs, because they're using pumps, they can be up to 65 feet away, which is nice. Now those uh, containers can be off in the robot room or in a utility room out of the way and not be subject to the heat of the summer or the very cold of the winter. Again, we want easy access and exclusion, and we want the animals to be forced to go through it. Um, and this is in a, a return alley, actually, but when you're dealing with a robotic farm, you're only letting out one or two cows at a time. It's very easy for them to get on through. Now, if you're going to let out an entire side of a double 24 herringbone parlor, then you might want to have two or three of these in the line. Otherwise, the animals, you'll never get them through there. Now, some can't be used in the winter time, and they must be winterized, which means you want to drain all the water from the system, flush the air lines, and then lubricate and retract all the pneumatic cylinders. So there's a little bit of maintenance that goes on with these things. And some also say they don't recommend using copper sulfate. Now, the foot bath itself is usually 304 stainless steel, which is not a problem. It turned a little green, but no big problem. The problem becomes all of this galvanized steel along the sides, uh, the zinc and the galvanization will react with the copper. So you'll get a corrosion going on. And the other thing I see in a lot of these is they're only about 78 inches long or six and a half feet. And remember we said we like to have them 10 to 12 feet long. If you watch animals walk through these shorter foot baths, you'll see that two of the feet get submerged twice and two of the feet only get submerged once. And you'd really like to have a minimum of three submersions if you can. Now, segregation pens. Many will see this as wasted space since it is so infrequently occupied. Uh, we had one farm in Texas where if they don't have any animals, they know they're gonna end up in here. They actually open up the gates because the barn is already stocked a little more than 100%. Uh, that way, it relieves some of that overstocking pressure. Now, however, when it's coupled with, say, a robotic milking system, it allows for full use of the herdsman capabilities of that system. So any cow requiring special attention can be redirected to this pen following milking. Then the herdsman, the vet, the breeder, et cetera, can find the animal without having to search the entire group. Remember, with these systems, we're trying to measure the manage the exceptions and not everybody else who is already doing well. And when they're here, the animal still has access to feed, to water, and area to lie down, and of course, the robot, so she doesn't miss any milking. And treatment stalls, even in the healthiest of herds, at some point, all animals will need to be vaccinated, hoof trimmed, dry treated, etc. Now, these activities cannot and should not be completed in the milking stall. You know, you never want the animals to associate the milking stall with a traumatic experience. You think you have fetch cows now, you're having a uh, traumatic experience, you're gonna have more than what you bargained for. Now, it's usually located in or near uh, the segregation pen so that you can move them uh, easily from one point A to point B. And the gating should be set up such that one per point, one person, can move the animal quickly, quietly, and safely with little effort. And ideally, you like to have about six feet of open area around this uh, stall because this can provide ease of access to the animal as well as an escape zone for the, the herdsman should an animal become unruly. Now, in the treatment area, too, we like to see you know, a computer terminal for in inputting data. And it used to be this was, you know, you had to run a Cat5 cable out to uh, some sort of a watertight cabinet. And in there was a monitor and perhaps a mouse and a keyboard. You could input the data. 
But now with a smartphone or tablet technology and a little Wi-Fi, we can accomplish pretty much the same thing without having to hardwire something out there. And we like to have some equipment storage out there and that should be weatherproof. Now, that means you're not gonna be able to really run down to like Office Max or whatever and get some sort of steel two-door uh, cabinet for storing these things. However, some of those Rubbermaid uh, pool uh, storage cabinets work really well. You just may have to put a little of that sticky sided weather stripping on there to keep some of the dust out. Durable vet supplies can stay out there, things like OB chains, foot wrap, maybe an IV rig. But again, you're dealing with a little bit of dust and dander in these areas. So the best thing when you put these out there, maybe should be in a, something like a Ziploc bag to protect them. Hoof nippers, hoof knives, extra foot blocks can be out there but you definitely don't want to put the epoxy out there. Uh, much of that stuff, again, is temperature sensitive, so it won't handle the cold of winter and the heat of summer. Certain topical treatments, disinfectants and lubes can go out there as well, but definitely no antibiotics or vaccines. And you're probably, based on animal health regulations too, you're gonna to wanna to keep these uh, in some sort of secure pharmacy area within the barn. Added restraints, maybe for tying up hooves so you can trim them, or maybe halters so you can set up the IV. And it's always nice to have some water out there too. And this is where a frostless hydrant can be really handy, especially when it comes to washing things down. And what would be really nice is that there was some hot water supply out there. Now, maybe you're close enough to the robot room that you can just have a hose bib out there, uh, hooked to the water heater inside the room and just run a short hose when you need it. And another thing is a management rail, which is nice if you have to deal with multiple animals at the same time. In this particular farm, uh, they use it when they bring the pre-fresh and the spring and heifers up, they can run them up into the here, do any vaccinations they need to. Here they can also trim all the cow switches if they need to, and just give the animal a good looking over for putting her over into the pen. Now on the other side, it actually drops down and here they can get a close look at the underside of the animal. They can flame udders if they want, check feet and legs if they need any, uh, any additional assistance. And then they also use it when the animals are dried off because now you can run the animals in, dry treat them, especially in this case, they were drying off one day per week. So the 15, 20 animals that they would run up, they could run in here dry treat everybody, it's, again, it's out of the milking stall, it's away from anything associated with the milking stall, and then they can do them all bing, 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 moving through quickly. Brushes, gates, and computer feeders, you wanna locate these away from the ro robotic milkers and the feed bunk, because these are cow congregation areas. These are traffic jams just waiting to happen, so you definitely don't want them anywhere near the robotic milker. And just, we got a little bit of time here. I thought I'd throw this in. And that's training with the personnel. And we'll talk about animals a little bit too, but we really need to cross train the staff on the various parts of the system. You know, no one person should be the repository of all the information on the operation and maintenance of these systems. You know, sports teams consider it building depth in your bench. NASA calls it system redundancy. You know, this way, if the primary is out or otherwise unavailable, you still have the backup person handy. And you wanna avoid making spouses and close family members backups of one another because both may be out to go to a wedding, funeral, vacation, family dinner, whatever. But if you have different people from different families, chances are that's not gonna happen. Unfortunately, that may require a little more creativity when you get to small farms where all you have are, you know, family members. Now, training the animals. You know, if we're talking calf feeders, the calves probably should be guided into the feeder two or three times a day for the first few days. And even consider ad lib feeding for about the first three days. That way, whenever she goes to that feeder, she's gonna get fed. And that's what will ingrain into her. She won't understand hey, I went there three times, I went fourth and fifth time and got nothing, what's the deal? 
But if she has that for three days, she'll get used to the idea that every time I go there, or pretty much every time I go there, I'm going to get fed. Now, placing some one-way gates in the prefetch pen trains them to push through these gates uh, when they're flowing in the correct direction. You know, and computer feeders help them to learn to approach the robot. You know, if you offer a little grain as a reward, it's really best that this can be a dummy robot. In other words, just the frame without all the milking arm and everything else with it. That way, all the sights, the sounds, the smells, everything are very familiar to them by the time they get out to the milking group. And train fresh cows to visit the robot three times a day for about the first five to seven days. And first calf heifers about twice a day. And But you really don't need to send them to the robot if it's been less than four hours since their last visit. You really don't want to overdo it if you can. And it, we have found too that you really don't want to limit that visitation for the first three to five days. Hey, if she wants to visit 19 times a day, let her. The only thing is you may want to limit the grain after about the fourth visit. There's no sense having her pig out and you having to do some sort of ruminotomy or, or uh, having to deal with some subclinical acidosis. So do we have any questions? Tim, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really interesting. I loved seeing all of the pictures of the different facilities um, that, you, that you have from all over the country. So thank you so much. Um, so before we get into questions, I just want to remind everyone um, that this is a series of webinars. And uh, so please come back and join us. Uh, next week, uh, we will have Harrison Hobart from Alltech talking about drone technology um, with forage inventory. Um, and I will put the rest of the schedule up on the screen now and then pass it over to my colleague, Lindsay, to handle questions uh, directed towards Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylin. Uh, thanks, Tim. So we do have a few questions. Um, Tim, our first question is, for the growing number of digital technologies on farm, what tips do you have about appropriate internet connectivity? Well, it's, yeah, that's, sometimes we, we have the cart before the horse in, in that regard where um, we have the ability to do this, but we don't necessarily have the infrastructure to do it well. Uh, it would be nice to have high-speed internet. Uh, sometimes that just isn't possible. The uh, landlines have not gone out that far from, uh, say, residential centers. Uh, some of the satellite-based systems were kind of iffy a few years ago, but they seem to be getting better and a little stronger now. So I would just, you know, would suggest, you know, spending a little extra and getting as as high a speed internet as you can. Okay, um, you have you talked about encouraging um, animals. So this question is asking why you would encourage primiparous animals twice a day, but multiparous animals three times a day. Well, these animals are still kind of growing, and we really want them to not expend too much energy, but um, get. Uh, get enough rest in there in between milkings. And usually they're the easier ones to train anyway because they're not having to break, uh, you're not having to retrain, break bad habits um, of the animal. When, we, when the herd makes that transition from parallel, or uh, excuse me, parlor milking to robotic milking, very rarely is it a first calf heifer that rejects the milking stall. It's usually some third or fourth lactation uh, cow that she gets a look at it and she says, uh-uh, I am not going in there. That's not how I've been milked. That's not the way we're gonna do it. Um, so it's usually the younger animals don't need as much training as the older animals. Um, this question uh, is, I guess, a little bit more of a bigger picture question to some of your ideas. So um, when you're a smaller producer and you, you have space problems, it gets hard to have all these different installations that you talked about and, um, you know, different unique things that could make management easier. Do you have any recommendations on how to optimize space? 
Boy, that's almost a, <laughs> I'd want to sort of handle that on a case by case basis. Um, you know, and that's, again, that's where I say, you know, when we talk about, you know, are we going to minimize the capabilities of these technologies because we are trying to put them into a space that they're not meant to be in? Um, yeah, I, I understand, too, that new facilities are expensive. Uh, we recently had a quote on a project for concrete at 175 bucks a yard. Um, so, yeah, facilities are not cheap. And yes, you do see that money that's going out, but one thing you will never see is the money that potentially could have come in if you had gone for a newer facility. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's almost one of those things that you almost need to see on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. <clears throat> And I guess kind of going off that case by case basis and trying to kind of understand, you know, the, the pros and cons of each facility. Another question is, what metrics would you look at in terms of measuring or defining if a facility is good or not? So line time, production, call rate, what are some of the things that you would take into consideration when kind of determining whether a facility is, is good or, or poor or worth saving or not? Well, I think a lot of it, you know, like we said, if it's... Um... If it's not meeting this, the ideal specifications that we'd like to have in terms of, say, cow comfort, and there's nothing we can do to, you know, make that without a huge investment, then that's when we say, okay, maybe it's better just to start and do another, do another facility. Um, so yeah, I would look at. Can we respace stall dividers? Is the distance on, you know, from curb to curb on a stall bed, forward facing stall bed, can we, is it big enough? Um, we had one farm that we looked at that it was built back in the late 70s, and the curb to curb outside to outside was less than 13 feet. And this is supposed to be head to head stalls. And it's just, you know, there's no, you can't get, you know, you've got a 15, 1600 pound animal in there. They're going to be butting heads. And you're really only going to use half the stalls because nobody's going to want to be in the stall opposite that one. And eventually what we did is we made that a springing heifer barn and built a new <laughs> facility with the proper size stalls and alleys in it. Uh, so, also kind of going off of that, talking about what they did with the existing facility. So, and again, this is a, a bigger picture, probably case by case basis. Um, and you and I have talked a little bit about this, you know, with some specific cases, but if a farm does make a decision to build new, what are some ways that you've seen farms successfully use their old existing buildings? Um, whether it's a small free stall or an old tie stall barn, what have you seen that has worked? And I guess also, what have you seen that, that maybe people should not do? <laughs> Um, well, kind of I'll answer that sort of from the from the last question to the first question, first part of the question. A couple of years ago, I uh, worked with a farmer. He was looking to uh, build a, a heifer barn because the old tie stall barn uh, was not big enough to do what he needed to do. And he said, "I wished I had not done this because about three or four years earlier." He had gone through and retrofitted the barn, and he said, you know, all I did was I cleaned up a, 40, a, a 1940s barn, and I still have all the uh, high labor demand associated with that barn. Um, so when you're looking at trying to perhaps repurpose these things, look at, okay, how can we put something efficient in there? Quite often, you, you've dealt, we've dealt with, uh, you know, making it a calf barn because grandma is tired of feeding calves in three feet of snow. Um, but if we design it right, you know, we can make that quick and easy and ventilate it well and make it a healthy environment for the calves. 
And a lot of times on these older facilities, there are uh, limitations on dimensions. You know, you're walking into a barn and you may only have seven feet of clearance between the, the floor and the bottom of the floor joists above you. So that kind of limits you on turning it into a shop because there's no way you're going to get a piece of equipment in there, obviously. Um, and maybe there's another uh, facet of the, of the farm system or maybe even another enterprise that isn't animal related. You know, hey, mushrooms are a pretty expensive deal right now. Uh, the, some of these old tie stall barns are pretty dark and pretty damp. You know, that might be something. But yeah, case by case basis. And what are your strengths as a manager? And what else can we do with it? Um, so another question asks, what do you think are the biggest deterrents to retrofitting facilities? Tunnel vision. Uh, you know, we've this barn was was grandpa's and we did this and we did that and it's worked well and and you know we got to be able to use it. Well, it'd be nice to be able to use it, but sometimes it requires some out of the box thinking, some really you know, a real paradigm shift. Now, for some farmers, a paradigm shift is a cataclysmic event, but, uh, you know, we need to look at you know, what else can we do with this and still make it a profitable entity without perhaps a, a huge uh, uh, investment or, you know, something other than you know, doing what we're doing that's going to cost us a bunch of money and yield and that really not improve performance or our lifestyle at all. In your opinion, how much lower performance uh, is accepted in robot barn remodelings compared to new buildings? So they've listed cows per robot production, labor demand. So how much lower performance is accepted in robot barn remodelings compared to new buildings? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know if, there, if there's a, you know, I can say, well, 5% or 10% or whatever. It, this is where it will probably be on a case by case basis where as you're working with the farm, all right, if we do stay with this older barn, it's still going to take us X amount of time. That's X amount of labor or we might have this reduction in animal performance. Um, okay, versus that, how does that stack up as we do a partial budget, perhaps? You know, going new versus old, all right? What are we going to lose? What are we going to gain? And, and what's the bottom line on all this? Yeah, I wish I had a specific number to tell you. Yeah, if it's 12%, hey, go this way. If it's 11%, go that way. But I don't really have a good answer for that. Mm -hmm. And that's hard too, because you're going to be factoring out, you know, well into the future to look at the cost of the barn long term, but also to a small, a small, um, you know, change in labor efficiency is going to make a big difference over, over the course of several years. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we kind of a follow up to, to some of what we talked about is how do you use data to help the farmer make the decision they have? Well, and this that would probably be a good question to put to your, um, if you have a uh, dairy, what we call a dairy profit team or just a management group that has several of your professionals where you meet together. This would be like your financier, your vet, uh, your nutritionist, anybody else in there. And you look at that data. Okay, what do we know on these? What are, where are we at? Where do we want to go? And all right, what's it going to cost us to get there in terms of remodeling or building new? Do we have room to build new without shoehorning it into the farmstead here? Uh, do we need to look at a green site? Again, I almost hate to say it, it's almost like this is what we do on a case by case basis because every farm is different. There's no, no such thing as a cookie cutter farm. So there's, unfortunately, there's no cookie cutter answers. Yeah, it's my, my favorite answer to give is it depends. 
Yep. Um, and yeah, like you said too, it really depends too on what the farm's goals are. So, you know, one farm might be able to make this barn work based on what their goals are for the future, but another farm for them, it just might not be, might, might not be the right choice. Um, <clears throat> so this is more of just a comment, but maybe we can talk about maybe some ways that you could, you could have an impact here. Someone said, this can be a vicious cycle. If you don't have good facilities, you're not efficient. And if you're not efficient, you can't afford good for good facilities. So maybe Tim, you can just talk about some of the ways that farmers have um, have made those changes. Obviously understanding that's a huge financial jump sometimes talking about a new facility, but maybe some examples of farms that have done it um, in stages or ways that they've tackled that hurdle. And I think that's a lot of it right there. If we can break it down into manageable milestones, we can look at, all right, what do we do? You know, maybe the first thing is, you know, we can't put a whole lot of money into this uh, older facility or we don't want to. You know, maybe we want to look at robots, but we we have this stall barn that, um, you know, we could, it's still pretty functional. Well, maybe instead of going for a new parlor or going whole hog right out to the robots right away, you know, step up parlors are fairly inexpensive and they tend to fit really well in some of these stall barns. Um, and then if you can, you know, that will make you milk that way, maybe for the next five or 10 years, resale value on those seems to be pretty good uh, to the point where, all right, in this five or 10 years, now we're gonna, uh, we'll migrate to that newer free stall with robots in it. Um, just stepwise incremental jumps that way. Uh, if we can break it down again, you know, case by case basis, what can we do? What do you want to do? Where do we want to go? And, you know, what are the intermediate steps to get there? <clears throat> yeah. And you mentioned too, a, a good uh, component of, of making those decisions is having a, a profit team or a management team. And there is some funding available uh, depending on where you're located. Um, but Cornell does have some funding for some profit team management team groups to help you get you know, all those players at the table um, and make some of those decisions and map out the future of the farm. Um, I There's one more question and then um, we'll give it a couple minutes to see if anyone else has anything to add. Um, what's one of the most common things farmers tell you they wish they changed or did differently after they've built a new barn? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, no, it, it's it's unfortunate. That's the way it's been. I've seen that so many times, um, and some of it is is not. And I'm not looking to throw anybody under the bus, but sometimes they have received some not great direction. Um, and you have people kind of overstepping their areas of expertise. Um, but there are a number of times that, yeah, they have made the investment or what they have done as well as maybe not made enough of the investment. They try to, you know, cut corners and whatnot. And sometimes you can, you know, trip over a dollar to save a dime. And, uh, they don't go quite far enough and they don't realize all of the benefit of everything else that they did do. It's almost like that, you know, the, the short stave analogy that, you know, the barrel can only hold as much water as it's, as it's short as stave. And a lot of these systems, because they have not done all of what they need to do, um, things are lacking in it and they don't realize the benefit of the whole system just because there is that one key piece that's missing or is not where it should be. <clears throat> yeah, and like you mentioned too, you know, getting getting advice, so getting a second opinion is always, always a good idea. And, you know, with producers that you and I have worked with, finding it really beneficial to, to take them out and ask other producers. The more that they can get out and see other facilities, ask farmers, you know, what did you do? What didn't you do? And yeah, what would you have changed so that I don't have to make that same mistake? Yeah, and this is where, you know, they say we, 
farmers need to be more interdependent rather than independent. And ask them, you know, ask your neighbors, ask other people, you know, especially when you go to, you know, Farm Bureau meetings or um, uh, any other farm related meetings, you know, talk to people, see who's done what and what they found out, what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, nobody knows as much as everybody. Um, so the more you can ask and talk, and like you say, somebody else has probably made that mistake once already. And if we can share experiences, I think everybody benefits. Okay, um, that is our last question. So uh, thank you, Tim. And I'll pass it back over to Caitlin to wrap us up. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. And thank you again so much, Tim, for your presentation today and answering all those questions. That was a great discussion. Um, before you sign off, I just want to uh, remind everyone that if you do have a friend or a colleague that wasn't able to make it to the webinar today, we are recording all of the webinar sessions and they will be available on the Pro Dairy um, YouTube page at a week after um, our last webinar on February 28th. So thank you again for joining us today and we hope to see you next week.